back to the future with uh, Alejandro Medehendis. That's the almost uh, the end of our marathon. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm happy to say that. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, I, I close the event right now, but uh, starting to uh, almost see uh, the end of the, the. I see the lights out of the tunnel. Uh, I'm just uh, desperate to see uh, to see like the, the sun rising up. So I can it means uh, the marathon has been finished. So for those who uh, have never heard about Melandro Melendez, uh, Melandro Melendez has uh, uh, been part of our previous uh, pack in Chamonix. Uh, he did a, a nice presentation. He's been also involved in several conferences. He is. Uh, um, also a part of the birth bite, um, birth bite uh, community, and he's uh, uh, having a podcast, uh, Birth Bite Espanol. Uh, so, um, and Leandro usually do uh, a really funny presentation from my perspective. Uh, it's always fun to hear about Leandro and he's always um, make always the point. Uh, so, he have, of course, he's a uh, an expert on many different tools, and I'll go there on that direction. Uh, today, he's going to talk about um, uh, Pinto, Pareto, and performance. So when I look at the title, I say, what, the, what is this? Pinto. <laughs> and then I say, Pareto, what? And then I look at the slides, and I discover uh, something. I say, what? <laughs> All right, so I'm not going to spoil much of your presentation, sure. Uh, I'm going to keep uh, the mystery behind those words, but uh, I really like the, the way you're presenting it. So um, uh, from the slide perspective, it seems pretty, it's pretty, it seems like a Leandro Melendez presentation. When you look at the slides. So I'm pretty excited to, to hear your content uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, follow up with the Q&A where I'm pretty sure that's a, a lot of things I'm gonna learn from out of that session. So I uh, disable my webcam. I'll let you share your screen. Okay. And and I will uh, come back for the Q&A session in 30 minutes. Okay. Is my screen being shared? Yeah. Awesome. I can see your screen, yeah. But I, yeah, the slide. Excellent. And then go to the right. Go to what? Presentation mode. And, and we can hear, we can hear Mr. Mark Tonson in the background. We have the honor to have him talk. So if we hear any uh, comments, I think it's going to be probably from Mark. Yeah, my job is to just sit here and have a little single malt scotch. Ah, uh, we've seen you before, <laughs> uh, Just one thing, uh, you're showing us the presenter mode. So I can see the copy there. Not showing the, the slideshow. Switch the. Is that better? To hide presenter view. I already did. Oh, oh. oh there it is. Oh, that's perfect. perfect. I have a lag. I got to take that into account. Lovely. Okay. So, ready, everybody? I think that is a yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, hi, everybody. I am uh, Leandro Melendez. I am a performance tester, a scripter, engineer, and somehow, what, somewhat, an idealist. I'm a performance testing manager at Qualitas Group. Uh, I have had a lots of experience and uh, several different projects for the last 10 years. From the, the ones that I have found, lots of vices, weird paths of action that the, uh, my clients uh, take and just plain ignorance in terms of performance, uh, which then made me decide to be, uh, to get a secret, secret identity and wear the spandex mustache, not pants, thank you. Uh, to fight against the bad practices and performance testing, uh, inertia in bad processes, and to fight against plain ignorance, ask Senor Performo, as you may know me, from my blog, uh, www.srperf.com, uh, on socials um, as well, all the social networks. I'm the host, as you mentioned, as uh, Henrik mentioned, of the Perf Bites and Espanol podcast, a member of the Perf Bites family. 
And last but not least, I like to do public st speaking, uh, spread the word of performance, which will it's what we will do today. It's uh, funny that Henrik refers it at the very Leandro Melendez uh, presentation. I hope you have fun, and I want to generate an impact on you and uh, help you to learn and uh, show you the economical impacts that uh, performance testing practices can have on your uh, budgets and money. So, uh, the, if the title sounds a little bit boring, uh, as I said, uh, I'm gonna make it about moolah, the money. We're gonna be um, showing you how this, uh, the, the, the money intersects with uh, performance testing and especially how you can get some long-term impact. I will give you, uh, in most of the examples that we will go through, two different options to choose from and uh, analyze them, we will. But first, um, you may have noticed that uh, many, uh, many environments do not have sight beyond sight, as the Thundercat said. We're gonna be saying here performance, oh, instead of Thundercats. So uh, we will be uh, looking at the intersection of this sight beyond sight, this vision, performance and money. So with this, you will avoid to be visited by your future self and tell you you should have done this this way instead of doing the, it in the bad way that probably you would have done if you didn't see this presentation. So to make this analysis in between the options that I'm going to be showing you, we will do some calculations here and there. We're going to run the numbers. Don't worry, it won't hurt much. And uh, I'll try to make it as clear and entertaining as possible, uh, as usual. So many of you would tell me, does this happen in real life, uh, that uh, the, the, the bad decision in terms of performance testing might affect you? or that uh, the corporate judgment uh, with long, lo uh, short-term um, impact might affect. And uh, for the skeptics, I will uh, tell you some stories. One is a real life story, and I will give you some of these exercises for everybody that is doubting that this is possible. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is based on a true story. Uh, to start off picturing what is a bad decision, the lack of vision, and what can go wrong in many circumstances. So first, uh, for this, I'm going to talk to you about the Pinto. For the ones of you that might be too young or unfamiliar with this, it was a Ford uh, car model launched in 1971. Uh, it was named after a pony. It's a small horse, uh, and it was addressed to the economy market. Because of this, um, it was it had a gold price to be very cheap for the day, two thousand uh, dollars. It's almost fifty years ago, so uh, it might sound like a very extremely little, but it was cheap on those days. And because of this, it was designed uh, really, really fast. It was the fastest designed face for a car ever, and I think still is. And because of this, it was cheap stuff, all cheap, all cutting corners and uh, avoiding uh, several different uh, good practices could happen in car design. And when uh, you cut corners, uh, you tend to trip off. Uh, there are hidden costs of racing a project, pun intended. And uh, as, it, uh, as I was saying, it happened. The pony had issues, several actually. One of them was outstanding. The gas tank had several, uh, a huge flow. It tended to get fire when you got a small collision in the rear, Explosion. explosions. And uh, of course this costed uh, some lives and had some easy fixes that could be applied to it to mitigate the problem. Of course, throwing some money at it and fixing it. But what happened? The first option that the Ford co Motor Company had uh, was to apply a fix to the fuel tank, which consisted of adding a padded uh, area to the rear bumper to give some space for the tank to not explode. The estimated fixed cost of this uh, was of $11 per car, 
there were uh, 12.5 car, million cars uh, at that moment for the calculation that the Ford Motor Company did. And it was applied also for trucks, not only Ford cars, several cars were counted into this 12 point million, but they ran the numbers through it. And uh, it was an interesting thing is that these trucks also had the same issue with uh, fill tanks. Uh, it was like they shared those designs very much a la microservice style. So all of these numbers added up to $137 million uh, on those days. Uh, infl inflation adjusted, it was $870 million that they were trying to save uh, or that would have costed them to apply this fix to all those cars. The option B, which was what they went for, uh, was first to assign a cost to each event. Uh, they said there were 2,100 cars that were being burned each year, more or less the cost of repairing them was of $700 uh, each. There were uh, 180 people on average being burned each uh, period, costing each burn to them uh, $67,000. And on top of that, they calculated the actual number of people that were dying out of those accidents, those explosions. 180 people calculated each one of them, $200,000. Uh, yeah, they were assigning a price to a human life, which already sounds uh, a little bit iffy, but uh, they ran the numbers that way. And they calculated that the total cost of just living as it is and just pay the fines, pay compensations was going to be around $50 million. Uh, inflation adjusted the equivalent of about three, a little over $300 million uh, for this time. So looking at these options, uh, if you want to find out more, the study, uh, it was a leak on those times. That was a big scandal of how they calculated those options. If you want, you can go and look for it on the online. You can easily find the original document. So the two options that I was uh, mentioning uh, option A is what was to apply the fix to the fuel tank, which had a total cost of $137 million, or leave it as it is and pay the fines, which was $50 million. I know it might sound uh, like an evil decision, uh, especially putting the uh, price to the lives of people, but just assuming that it's just a matter of a decision in terms of money, we are going to see which one is the uh, best if you, we just Think about money. Obviously, in a short-term vision, it would have been the $50 million. It's cheaper, it's easier, and business profit-wise, uh, again, forget about the putting cost to a human life. It was better, short-term vision. Again, we're gonna try to look a little bit further if they had the sort of omens and they could see, look, uh, have side beyond side. What would have happened, what happened uh, uh, actually, and what would have happened if they chose one option over the other? So using uh, the side beyond, uh, beyond side and an actual history of what happened, if they would have chosen option A, which was pricier, the future cost for them would have been to face less trials, have better reputation, and less uh, production and fixes cost. It was only the $11, and it would have been comparatively smaller cost. Why? Because if they took option B, which is what they did, uh, cost them multiple trials and investigations uh, being sued, uh, their reputation was severely damaged, that's priceless, and they had 1.5 million cars recalled uh, to be fixed and um, even taken away. It was the largest ever in history. So the, the, the cost was huge and tangible. So looking into the future, this would have made a uh, Peculiar difference if Ford would have uh, decided to spend what seemed a little bit higher, but gave lots of more benefit to them. They ended up with uh, almost going broke, if I remember well, and just because they wanted to save about $90 million. So uh, they lacked the vision to, to take into account several different factors, and they would just go into the inertia, we, we'll just save uh, money which is not the best approach always. You have to be able to look into several different uh, variables. So what we are going to do now is to do a similar analysis into performance automation to figure out how to tell what is important for a load testing project and to be able to use this side beyond side and do better choices. So 
a common misconception in performance automation is to try to automate everything or try to automate at least what seems to be important to the business and to say, I think this is a VIP process that must be performance tested or automated. But how do we really know what is important in terms of uh, load automation and performance testing? What is important to the business, is it for automation or not? So one uh, hint that I'm gonna give you, in performance testing, uh, the automation is generally recommended only for load, for load simulation, where it is what uh, I would say makes more sense to use it. Many of you, might be wondering, well, how am I gonna know the response time of the processes without automation? We will look into that, be patient a little bit. I know it is usually the biggest uh, argument being used to automate everything and try to get response times from everything, but there are options and we will do an analysis of that as well. So back to the automation and performance. How to know if a process is actually important for a low test? Something important for the solution or the company might not be for the performance automation, which is more or less what we have been looking into. As we just saw, automation for performance is specifically or most commonly used for load. Then the process that generate the most load, ergo might be more important. But multi meaning that it's uh, the, one, it's the one that has multiple interactions, that has uh, more utilization to call it in a way. <laughs> so uh, I know many of you might not uh, still be convinced uh, because you have been told for so long what is important and what is not. And you know that there are processes that are very important in the process and that it's also important to get the response times uh, for every process in your um, available in your system. So how about we run some numbers again and we check on those options and what would happen if we do one thing or the other. We are going to, as I said, do some exercises. These are gonna be number exercises around money. So I will give you this example to do this exercise. We have the project and uh, code name uh, Snail. The project Snail has 50 business processes marketed as important for automation. One of those processes is called Snowflake. Snowflake happens only once a week and it's critical for the business uh, because it is so special. It's truly critical for the business. But uh, in our load test, it will happen only once. Each load test will happen one time and that's it. But um, it is also critical for the business to know if it performs well under load within the time and resources indicated within the scenarios that we're gonna be simulating. So let's do the exercise. Let's automate Snowflake. And to do this, we would usually need a consultant or a scripter going out into the market and checking how much does it cost for an hour of an automator, a scripter, or a consultant uh, for performance. It's in between about 50 and $100 an hour. Let's go in between, let's say $75 an hour, and uh, let's say how long it's gonna take. An average script for automation, well done, not just uh, click and, and record, record and play, replay. Um, well done, I mean, doing a test case, analyzing, putting all the uh, iterations, the concurrency, doing it well, well done, takes in between four to 16 hours per process, just for our friend Snowflake. So let's go in between, let's just throw at it, eight hours. Again, this process will be used only once in our test. The, when we execute the scenario, one, done. That's our automation. So running the numbers again. We have $75 per hour for a scripter to produce this. It will take him eight hours and it will be used only one time per test. This is 70 time, $75 times eight hours. It's $600 that it will take, it cost us to automate this process. $600 hours, uh, dollars, uh, divided by one will tell us uh, that it's gonna be used only once. It will tell us that it will cost us $600 to automate that click or per action, per iteration. So for the ones that uh, also want to measure the response time, it will cost us um, $600 to get that measurement of the response time of that process during the scenario. Now, moving the example to option B. Let's meet Bob. 
we have here um, our friend Bob, who is very well uh, versed in executing Snowflake. He's so good at it that it takes him only just a few minutes. He does it often. He's the SME for Snowflake. So uh, it just takes him a few minutes. Let's say it takes him an hour just to round up the numbers. Bob uh, is an employee in your company and he does well. He's getting paid about $5,000 per month. I, I like it. And um, a month, as we know, have about 170 hours uh, um, per month uh, of work. So let's run the numbers again. We have Bob earning $5,000 per month, 170 hours per uh, uh, contained in a month, and it will take him one hour to execute Snowflake. So $5,000 divided in 170 hours per month will give us uh, to let Bob execute it will will cost us twenty nine point five dollars. Let's say thirty, and he will execute it only once. So it's going to be thirty dollars for him to do that click, to run uh, the Snowflake process. Again, for the ones that want to get that measurement, it's the same. The click and the measurement will cost the same thirty dollars in comparison to the previous six hundred. So we have. Uh, on the left side, the script automation of the Snowflake process, with, which will cost us $600 uh, per click. An automation and performance will require maintenance. It requires time to create. And um, if the system goes through changes, again, it might require it to be uh, scripted all over again. On the other hand, we have Bob, which costs us uh, about $30 per uh, click or per hour. He's already on the payroll. He just knows very well the process. You can just call him to execute it. He tells very good jokes and he's well versed. If the system changes, he won't have any trouble figuring out how to run it again. So Bob is uh, a very good choice. Uh, with all the hints that I have been giving you, what option would you choose? I know uh, it might be to look a little complicated, but uh, let's go to the other piece uh, that I promised again and again. What about the response time? One option that we would have there with Bob helping us without the automation would be to add it manually, uh, which means more or less using a stopwatch, you're, you're doing the Mississippi counts, or uh, put the response time counting integrated into our process, which uh, I have already talked about it. You can put it inside of your code, or plain and simple, use an APM, monitor it. Uh, automatically get those values uh, from investing a little bit in the APM. So, what about that? Let's see. Let's see that uh, those other options. Most of the 50 business processes are snowflakes. The 50 business processes that we have in our snail project are snowflakes. They happen once, and out of all of those 50, there is one single process that happens a thousand times each uh, hour, uh, we, we will call it incessant. The incessant process happens a thousand times per hour in our scenario or in real life or uh, in our pro projections for production. Um, the script takes the same amount of time to be created as the snowflake. Incessant and snowflake take the same amount of hours. So. Let's, let's look at these numbers. What happens uh, if we do a cost analysis on uh, Mr. Incessant Process? Again, we said it takes $75 per hour on average to create it, and it takes eight hours. The big difference is that this happens a thousand times per test. So we multiply again, 75 times eight, we get a $600, but those $600 will be used a thousand times in our test will give us a total cost of 60 cents per click. Which one makes more sense? And on top of that, each measurement will cost us 60 cents just to be automated. So again, options time. We have Snowflake, which costs $600 per click. Happens once, and Bob can do it very cheap, very easily. We have uh, the incessant process, which costs 0.6, uh, 60 cents per click. It happens a lot, and if we asked Bob to do it, he wouldn't be able to, to, to do the click a thousand times in an hour. That's where it gets inhumanly possible to be done. So 
what option would you choose? Which one do you prefer to automate? The one that costs you uh, 60 cents per click or the one that costs you $600 per click? So it seems to be a complicated option. I don't think so. It's, uh, I think it's pretty clear. On the left hand, if you automated Snowflake, it would be like throwing money at the air. Uh, and if you did it for insistent, uh, you will be getting a very good bang for your buck. So uh, again, I want to reiterate, what happens more often is more important in terms of automation or load and performance testing. Uh, it's what happens the most, uh, what is more frequent, but a uh, question that you might have, how do I know which ones out of the 50 ones that uh, I have, how can I select or pick the ones that are good candidates for automation? So to do this selection, I'm gonna talk to you about a guy named Pareto, and uh, we will do some mula or money analysis based on what this friend said. But you might say, who's Pareto? Well, our friend Vilfredo Pareto was an Italian economist he was uh, very cool because he discovered what was named the Pareto Principle. You might not know the Pareto Principle, but maybe you may have heard of the 80-20 rule. Uh, it's the same thing. What, how, how was it stated? Mr. Pareto uh, said that in Italy, 80% of the land was owned by 20% of the people. That was more or less a generalization of what was the Pareto Principle, but it applies everywhere. Not only real estate in Italy, but in so many things that your mind would be blown. But for the sake of this um, presentation, the Pareto principle applies in performance testing and load testing because 80% of the load in systems generally comes from 20% of the processes. It's very similar to what he said. So how we are going to uh, proceed on this, I'm gonna give you a quick guide into, uh, a quick hitchhiker's, hitchhiker's guide into picking um, good automation candidates for performance testing, for load testing. First, focus on the, that 20% that generates 80% or more of the load. How are we gonna do that? Get a list of all the processes and list them by the order of occur occurrence, having the most frequent ones at the top and the least frequent ones at the bottom. We're gonna sum them, the total number of occurrences in the system of all our process, and we're going to find the top 80% of them, the cherry at the top of them. So how are we gonna deal with this? We have the big list of the processes. Let's, let's do the numbers again. The big list of the processes we have, I, I decreased it for the sake of this example from 50 to 15. So we have a total of 15 processes that are important. This is a real uh, world scenario, I just changed the name. A real customer had those processes, that list, and I sorted them by occurrence. It was just an accident that they are sorted alphabetically as well, but for the sake of the example. So now we will sum the total of the events. You can see the total at the bottom and get the percentage from the total for each one of the processes. As you can see in that division, process A is 34%, process B is again 34%, 17 for C and so on. Once that we have the percentages, we will start adding them up and until from the top to the bottom until we reach at least 80% or above that. That is going to be the, the, the list that we're going to pick. And the other ones, well, let's say, the, fir the very first ones are the ones that are going to be give us the very best bang for the buck, as I explained in the example, will be the ones that are going to be the cheapest to automate and will receive more benefit out of them. The next ones are okay. It, that, that'll depend on your preference if you want to be a little OCD. And the last ones, I would say it's an absolutely no. Th those are very good candidates for Bob or whoever else can contribute to execute them manually or just bring them in the room when you are running the test. So let's, let's run some more numbers. Out of the original 15 processes, the automation for each one of them, we already more or less calculated that would cost us $600. So if we have 15 of them and we decided to automate them all, well, we will never hit all the automations and the business processes that the system has, but let's say we, we reach almost 100% of them, it will cost us $9,000 to do a set of automation for every single, well, 15 processes. Most systems have more than 15. Now, if we chose 
in the list that we saw earlier up to the meh we, we went on the great ones and the meh ones we will choose seven business processes seven out of them for uh, six hundred dollars each one will give us forty two hundred dollars uh, it will cost us forty two hundred dollars to cover ninety eight percent of the load to generate ninety eight percent of the load in the system that's less than half the price and we just went from 99 to 98. That's crazy. That's that's uh, deciding best effectiveness in your load and in your money. 56% of savings. So the next one, asking get, uh, Bob to help us, adding some of those $30 per hour, it will give us more bang for the buck and add some of the help. It's just $30 more, we can add them. Last, if we choose the only the 20%, the wow ones that I showed you at the top of the list, it's only three out of 15. Again, it's 20%, mysteriously, it, uh, the numbers uh, matched. Three times $600, we will be spending only $1,800, generating 80% of the load. The difference 15 is 80% of. We will be saving 80% of the cost, and we will be generating 84 or more percent of the load in the system. We will be covering most of the scenarios possible. So uh, the distribution here would be, we'll be getting more slices on our pizza and paying way less for it. Let's say you got 88% of your pizza and you only, uh, you got an 80% discount. Isn't that great? Yeah, it also looks like a Pac-Man. <laughs> it's a pizza Pac-Man. So um, the Pareto applied to the savings and having more efficiency. Uh, it takes decisions out of the picture, uh, but uh, still, which one are you going to decide? You would go with no savings, paying the no $9,000. Uh, I would say no thanks. The other options are the 50% off or the 80% off. It, that, there, it depends on you. How much do you want to, pu to push it? How much money do you have? How much can you save? That is an, a tough decision. That one, I, I will give it to you. It'll depend a lot on your preferences. How far do you want to push it? But generally speaking, you'll be safe hitting at least 80% of the load on your system, simulating it. So uh, to close up the presentation, I want to thank Mr. Pareto. He has helped uh, a lot on um, performance testing. And not only in that, as I said, uh, it applies everywhere. Thanks to him, we can increase the efficiency and money allocation and performance automation. We will be able to save money and spend it better, uh, performance test smarter, and uh, we will be developing a little bit of uh, side beyond side. Through this presentation, I wanted to show you a little bit how can doing some analysis, future projections, looking at different areas can help you do better performance tests, design better scenarios, and design and choose better on the automations. This applies as well, the side beyond side everywhere. Uh, as an example, a release for a rushed impact. If uh, your system is rushed and has performance issues and you say, we need to go out right now, you need to do that type of analysis and look into the future and be able to tell, is it better? Is it gonna be more expensive to release our little pony that is faulty? We must, if we don't, that's gonna be the end of the world. Or if the end of the world is not so expensive and you can just postpone it as well. The same goes to cl cloud releases that many people would say, they don't need performance testing when you have uh, scalable, out of scalable and expandable cloud uh, instances. Sometimes they have hidden costs that many might not be seeing at. And when you release like that, you will have bad surprises like uh, the Ford Motor Company had. There are many other examples, but for the sake of time and the time given by our friends, I think that is it. Uh, I thank you very much for your uh, help and your attendance. Oh, no, it's not this one, it's this one. Yay, thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, being at this presentation, paying attention to my silly examples, my silly, silly examples. Uh, but now it's time for the questions. Um, I think, uh, Henrik, are you around? I am here. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I learned a lot because uh, I didn't know that the 80-20 uh, rule was the Pareto stuff. So now uh, I can go to a cocktail 
and be invited by the ambassador and say, oh, uh, I will may apply the pilot rule here. So I, I really thank you because I think uh, I, 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 I'd be a little bit more clever when I talk to people. So thanks for that. Um, the other thing is uh, I just found a Pinto for sale. Uh, and surprising, I don't know if you look at the link, they're selling those cars for more than 8,000 bucks. Uh, so uh, for, a, for a crappy car uh, that has a bad history, I'm pretty surprised that it is still you can still buy those car with a with a as expensive. I thought I thought that with a couple of dollars you can get, get that. But uh, never mind. So that that's out of the presentation. So, uh, but it, yeah, I mean, you make the point. I mean, I thought that uh, that was obvious, the eighty twenty percent rule. But uh, it, it uh, you know, sometimes there are projects where. Uh, I, I, I have been involved in projects where people say, yeah, but you don't imagine it's the CEO who's going to use that functionality. People yeah, is, forcing, uh, is forcing you to automate. A job or something that has been scheduled or uh, yeah. is that, do you really want to use these resources automating something that is a cron job, it's already automated, it's already scheduled. So. Yeah, but if you don't and the CEO discovered that response is bad, we're going to add a job. I don't care. I'm going to put the price on that. How am I going to know without it if it's uh, performing in good? <laughs> Dude, it's asynchronous. Your automation won't tell you much. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, and then uh, usually Bob, it usually happens that Bob is a very busy guy uh, and he doesn't want to do those type of automation and he doesn't want to hook up with uh, uh, geek people, you know, the, the guys in, in the basement that do load testing. And uh, Bob preferred to stay up in the building, uh, take coffee with the, the marketing service uh, and, from, and, and, uh, and ensure the, his promotion. So uh, sometimes Bob is not so, so, so nice with us. Yeah, and, and many do not look at, Bob can be super busy, can be a key person in the company, but it's still more recommended to have him just trigger the process and be done, be gone. It's easier, cheaper, more reliable. Um, I don't know. I, I, I like to help, uh, to get help from Bob often. Yeah, I think the, the main problem is that this is more about uh, education and evangel uh, evangelizing our customers. And sometimes it, it's it's uh, seems more more. It's easier to, on the paper to expose it, but sometimes you you're you're face you're talking to a wall, and, and that that's 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 a shame. Uh, I may say that's why I decided to do this presentation about money because that's the language that usually management gets very well. And when you tell them, dude, you're going to save a lot, you, they, they'll listen to you. They'll pay attention. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a, uh, I'm going to, next time I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the uh, Pinto. Uh, I need to find a, a similar, a similar story with a French car, and if it's a French audience, of course. Because uh, huh. I think it, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty meaningful. Mark, I guess I guess you had all. Yeah, I, I guess Mark, you already have some same similar stories. I do. I just wanted to say um, that the Bob there's a there's a tangential or I'll say a a fringe benefit of working with Bob because Bob sounds like Bob or Bob could be a he or she I suppose Bobby could be. Uh, is that like you say from education, Henrik? Your point is that one, you're developing a relationship with somebody who might be a business subject matter expert, and they may know nuanced things that you don't know about that process. And in the in the work in developing a relationship with this person, you may learn that there's other tangential things that are really really good to learn from a load perspective. So when you it, let's say the snowflake. Uh, situation turns out to have a performance problem, you have a relationship with somebody who knows even the financial impact and maybe the technical other people and you're leveraging that relationship. And I think that's a really important part, uh, especially if you're a third party consultant um, or you're even just on the testing team and you just are building those relationships. So I think there's things that are not necessarily the dollars and cents hmm. of the calculation that are also valuable and beneficial uh, to a longer term operation 
Um, and that's, I, I see that when you mentioned Bob is, you, you said like, you know, the job could change and it only takes Bob a few minutes to do that. Well, you have the seconds to realize. And yeah. uh, I, I didn't run the numbers for that one, but I uh, needed more time for the example. Yeah. But as well, when you are creating test cases for um, performance testing as well, there's better bang for the buck if you get a chance to talk to Bob yeah. to get his guidance rather to be thrown at ALM and find out functional test cases and try to reverse engineer them to uh, for load testing. Or all the test data set up could be uh, like ex- really nuanced or something, yeah. Uh, only Bob might know, hey, Bob, what happens if I run two people try to access this record at the same time? He might yeah. be able to tell you right away rather than you uh, running around in circles trying to figure out what would happen or um, reverse engineer the process to figure out when Bob in three seconds can tell you. So it's cheaper and you actually more get efficient. more value out of it, yeah. Okay. And, and you're, you're yeah, but, better prepared for the job. Yeah, Yeah, but I think even that, I would make even that you made the point and you should, we should even go further and say don't trust the numbers. Uh, if the yeah. project says those are the business process, say uh, okay, maybe uh, give me the stats and I will figure out. Uh, yeah. Because uh, I think uh, we 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 not sh- we should not be uh, just simple cookers. We should be performance engineers and suggest say, all right, maybe that was true two years ago, but may you may have uh, the the the, the uh, production load or the, the way uh, your user is utilizing system has been changed. So. Give me, give me one day, give me some uh, insights on the data, and I will get back to you and, and figure out what, yeah. what we should be testing. Yeah, yeah it's uh, uh, um, faster, more efficient, and you will ensure. I, I, I cannot tell you how many times I've been thrown that. There's something process, figure it out, and then automate it. I don't even know if I'm doing the right steps, if I am hitting or the, the wrong ones, or. And we can get very good. Uh, Counseling from Bob into creating them. Yeah. And uh, as, like, as it was uh, mentioned, like mentoring. The, the relationship that you form afterwards. Hey, Bob, did you know what? My, maybe this process crashed. Why did it take so long when we were running something else? Mm-hmm. You can get valuable, uh, val- val- valueless uh, feedback yeah. from him. And uh, usually that business vision that Bob might have in a performance test, we might be in topology and metrics and hard drive reads and yeah. things that it's explainable by the business. <laughs> Easily, we we just saw something like that with the puzzles, where yeah, depending yeah. where's the beef is, where's going to be the the load in the yeah, system. <laughs> Henrik, uh, yeah, uh, Leandro, Leandro, Leandro took two performance puzzler sessions uh, yesterday. It was yeah, he told me about it. So I I only had a half, half I did only one hour, one hour and a half, I think, for, with the bench. Yeah, yeah. You, you did a performance puzzle with. Uh, Brian, I think it was, that was Brian, yeah. yes, with you. Yes. It was pretty cool. That's pretty fun. Yeah, yes. And they are infuriating. Yeah. <laughs> I loved it, but I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but did you, did you, uh, did you uh, uh, moderate uh, this performance puzzle by your own? Because last time you had, a, you had a, was Brian with you. No, it was just me. Uh, it, it's the, the real puzzle master, you know. Mm. At the Dynatrace conference, Brian Brian had an idea for a puzzle, so he wanted to try it. I still have his puzzle, um, which is a good puzzle. It's about like it has something to do with uh, rum because at Dynatrace yeah. has the VOU yeah, yeah. monitor, uh, and that was a pretty good one. But the, we did the uh, the bubbly boondoggle, and the other one was about a do-it-yourself telephony system. Hmm. Yes, with a, a really interesting topology. I can't give away the answer, Henrik. If that's that would not would not be good. Yeah, everybody has to be infuriating. I don't <laughs> want to take that away from no one. <laughs> cool. So uh, again, Yandro, uh, I knew I looked at your slides. So, uh, so big applause for your presentation. Yeah, so, I um, really appreciate and that uh, you have a Leandro uh, style of uh, presentation. Uh, I like to have that, uh, yes. to own it. <laughs> yeah. You will have your yeah. own chapter in the Zen presentation. <laughs> Other people are being sort of own kind of, you know, calming. I'm peculiar. You are uh, <laughs> eclectically challenging. <laughs> as long as not challenged. It's a... Right, right. Yeah, no, no, that's right. <laughs>
Thank you, Henrik. All right. You're welcome, Leandro. Uh, so we could, uh, let's take a, a very short break. Uh, if you want to respect the agenda for those who want to connect for uh, the last session. So uh, I, I may take a small break, even uh, if I would prefer to uh, you just continue. But uh, let's take the, the break to follow the agenda. And we would have uh, Mark that will uh, finish this, uh, this uh, marathon. So uh, I'm pretty excited that, uh, you to hear, uh, to, to see the Q&A session of Mark Collinson's sessions. Yeah. <laughs> that should be good. So when do you want to come back? It's starting at at uh, bottom of the hour. Normally it's a uh, three. Uh, so we have a fifteen minutes break. Okay. So yeah, at twenty three hundred. Our our at least our time is twenty. No, your no. You've been going for twenty two hours and almost twenty yeah. minutes. Yeah. You're yeah. We're, we're really getting close here. Yeah, almost. But I think uh, yeah. Last last year I don't I remember I don't know there was a. Uh, so we, we talked about this to and say, I don't, and last year was really painful. I don't, I don't remember why. And, and I think because uh, we, this year we just decided to separate the US two zones. So it's a bit easier, so three speakers and four speakers. Um, yes. But Leandro and I are actually on the East Coast of the US. I know. It's not that bad. I know. I know. But we, we, ch we changed the agenda because uh, you, I, I know you had, a, you had a boat trip with Bob uh, this afternoon. That's right. So we had to, we had we didn't and it did not require us to jump in the harbor and swim. <laughs> it was really good. I, I did actually if you before we totally break and we have another minute, I wanted to mention to Leandro, um, there's a lot of conversation you hear people who are very business like it, it, that really use the term ROI, return on investment, hmm. which is like a financial banking investment concept, right? So if you, let's say you spend $100,000 on a testing tool, if you use that testing tool for two days, you don't get $100,001 yeah. back, right? It doesn't grow, it doesn't accrue value as an as interest, right? So you don't get a return on the investment in mm -hmm. a positive sense. Um, so I, I, and you did a really nice job in the way you laid out and calculated your numbers. It's really cost and benefit. Mm -hmm. It's never like cost and revenue upside. It's cost and I'm exchanging money. Benefit for, for the test. Yeah, benefit in oh, uh, the outcomes of the test. The outcomes, the risk you're understanding or hedging, or the learning that you're going to have, or the valuation, the measurements. I think is the key phrase that you mm -hmm. use. The measurements that you're taking cost money to take, and those measurements are valuable. And so I encourage a lot of people to think about, you know, when you hear a salesperson or somebody, oh, well, what's the ROI? You know, that's that's kind of money business speak. Let's talk about it in terms of cost mm -hmm. and what kind of value do we... How do you realize it? Yeah, how do you realize you're going to spend some money, but what are you getting for that money? Mm -hmm. And and uh, and that's I think that's an important thing to differentiate. And the last thing I'll say is if people, if we give a shout out to our... Uh, a, a senior, senior, not senior, <laughs> uh, performance guy, Scott Barber, uh, who came up with the acronym FIBLOTS, F-I-B-L-O-T-S, mm -hmm. which are sort of some qualitative uh, memories. It's like there's, why would I want to load test a transaction? Outside of Pareto, there's, you know, financial reasons, risk reasons, liability, because my boss told me I need to. I mean, there's, <laughs> There's lots of reasons, but that's the FIB, FIBLOTS uh -huh. acronym. Uh, you can find it. It's, I think it's out on their uh, their um, Perfect Plus website. He has a blog out there. But it's, it's it's been around for years, like many, many years. And it's one that I bring up every now and then, which is different than a cost-benefit uh, analysis. But sometimes you could go through FIBLOTS. And maybe we go, mm -hmm. do, go do some financial analysis on all the different ones that you – like legal. What's the legal risk? I'm almost sure that financially it makes sense what he says. If yeah. you do the side by side and do yeah. some projections, exactly, yeah, it'll make sense. Yeah, so that would be cool. Yeah, but I, even I, even uh, even site reliability, you know, the book from Google, there's oh, a chapter yeah. about it. It says it says uh, you can you can uh, have a 98% availability, but if the the let's say the product owner says we don't, we want to go to 99.9. And then you start to figure out how you can get there, and you realize that it, cost, it will cost you two billion to get there. It doesn't make sense. So the the 
investment to get 1% extra mobility is so huge that sometimes you have to make the balance between what would be the effort to reach there and what uh, what about, uh, maybe, okay, maybe I could have 1% of my customer unhappy, but I, 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 will, lose one, I will lose potentially 1% of customers, but at the end, it will cost me less than uh, than investing those uh, huge two million dollars to to have that uh, that the uh, yeah. So rather than spending two billion dollars, you could actually hire a salesperson to go to their house <laughs> and take their order in person and hand deliver their product uh, and still save money and in a gold platter and it's still gold, cheaper. Exactly, it's still cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, so take yeah. a ten minute break, uh, Henrik. Yeah, and get back in uh, in ten minutes. All right, let's put okay. let's put Adios. the coffee break video. Gracias, amigo. <laughs>